Okay, good. And I'm just going to take a quick minute before we get started. Uh, I've been asked by a couple of graduate students who are putting together uh, a workshop for graduate students uh, for both in economics and in political science, people interested in international topics. I've just posted the link to the chat room. It's the one that doesn't say link to aerial slides. Um, if you're interested, uh, you can follow the link and learn more about that, uh, particularly your graduate students who might be interested in presenting and then people who might want to see what graduate students are up to. Uh, that looks like a, 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 good place to, uh, a good place to go. Okay, so then uh, Ariel, we're going to get started with you in a second. Uh, for those of you who are new, uh, the, we follow just the rules more like a, a regular seminar. If you have a question, just unmute and, and go ahead and interrupt the speaker just like you would do if we were all sitting here in person. Uh, Ariel, do you have any co-authors in the chat room or is it just you today? Is Jonathan okay. here or Sarah? Location. And Sarah, I don't know if she's there. <laughs> she's in Norway, but. Okay, okay. all right, good. So maybe it's just you. Okay, so then everybody, yeah, so then just go ahead and, uh, and break in with your questions when you're ready, and then we'll have time at the end. We just leave the stream open and, and we'll uh, kind of continue the discussion there. Okay, Errol, you have an hour. Uh, go ahead and take us away. Thanks so much for, for inviting me. Really, it's, it's great to, to get some of your feedback. This is like very you know, work in progress with Sarah Line, uh, University of Basel, and, and John. So, you know, so, so in, in international, we care a lot about expenditure switching defined as how consumers or firms substitute uh, either their consumption or intermediate inputs between domestic and imports in response to exchange rate movements or in response to changes in trade costs. That, that's a key elasticity that, that, that matters a lot in the models that we write for welfare and for the output or employment responses to exchange rate movements. So, uh, so that's what we want to think about in, the, in, the, in, this, in this work. And we're going to have data on, on, on consumer expenditure. So all that I'm going to talk about is, is consumption, uh, expenditure switching, not, not firms, for example, saying the use of intermediate inputs. And so we want to think about what are the margins of adjustment in response to, to an exchange rate movement. And we're going to be uh, looking both at imports versus domestic goods and a margin that is very relevant in a small open economy like Switzerland, uh, which is cross-border shopping versus domestic shopping. And it's, this is also relevant for, for a lot of small economies, or if you think about the border in Canada, when, when the border was open, uh, that, those are relevant margins. And in, in particular, we want, we, want to, we want to look at how these responses vary across the population. And uh, the dimensions of heterogeneity that we're going to focus on, given the, da given the data we have, are going to be household income, uh, rich versus poor. I'm going to talk a little about size of the household, but that's not going to be the, the, the focus. And uh, distance to, to the border, distance uh, to, to cross-border shopping. So we're going to look at how the same shock affects uh, households a lot along these, these dimensions of heterogeneity. And then I'm going to, given the facts that we're going to uncover, we're going to, the, the, the current applications we have so far, we, we're, we're, we're thinking about others, are uh, what are the welfare implications, differential across how exposed you are to, to the shock and, and, and the level of income, and what, it, what, uh, what's, what are the implications for, for local employment to, to exchange movements. And so we're going to, we're going to uh, base our empirical analysis on and the, the January 15, 2015 appreciation of the Swiss franc against the euro, which was kind of um, that, that, I, that, I, uh, that, I, that I've already been uh, looking at in, 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 an, in another paper. Um, so, you know, so, so let me give you a bit of context of what, what, why, why we like this shock. So uh, in, in 2011, September 2011, after a, a pronounced appreciation of the, of the Swiss franc, the Swiss National Bank, the SMB, introduced a minimum exchange rate against the euro of 1.2 francs per euro. Because uh, I mean, there, was, there had been a strong appreciation before that. And the, the floor was in place until January 2015. So basically, uh, the, I'm not going to get into all the details, but uh, basically foreign developments, especially the anticipation of of quantitative easing by the, by the European Central Bank, 
made made it very costly for the Swiss National Bank to keep this this um, floor in place. They were accumulating tons of uh, reserves of everybody that wanted to buy, get into 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 Swiss franc assets, and it, it became very costly for the for the Swiss National Bank to to to, to keep that uh, to 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 keep this policy. So in January 15, 2015. Uh, the SMB unanticipatedly abandoned the, 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 this policy. And after that, as I showed you before, there was a large unsigned appreciation of the, of the Swiss franc. Against the Euro, against the Euro but also against, in a, in a trade-weighted sense also, uh, although the, the appreciation was more prolonged against the Euro. So why, why do we like this episode to think about a bunch of things? I mean, as a clean exchange of shock, at first, it followed a period of remarkable exchange rate stability, as I showed you before. So, so the, the exchange rate ranged between 1.2 and 1.25, uh, while the minimum exchange rate was in place. Um, and it moved between 1.2 and 1.22 in the last six months. So, um, so we can really identify kind of the, the prices that we're going to look, be looking at that uh, are not reflecting prior movements in the exchange rate. The exchange was large in magnitude, and 20% in, the, in the, the date of the announcement, and then 14% by the end of the first quarter, 11% by the, by the end of the year. By the end of 2007, the exchange rate went back more or less to the same, at least the, the real exchange rate went back to the same level. So, I mean, it's not as large as Argentina 2001 or, or, or Mexico 95, but it was, it, it, it's still pretty large for, for, for a developed country. And uh, I mean, especially for Switzerland, um, this was like, it's a very stable economy. So um, the, the exchange rate appreciation, the policy is really a response to, to a policy response to, to foreign events. So it's not like there's a crisis and then uh, there was a change in the, in the exchange rate. So that's very different to other large appreciations or depreciations that people have looked at. Um, so here's kind of a review of what happens to prices, uh, this is year zero, month zero is always December 14. Okay. So this is basically uh, for, for, I'm gonna tell you about the data in a few minutes, but let me give you an overview. So this is like, these are Swiss produce prices. Okay. This is relative to, to December 14. So you see prices went down by like maybe less than 1% in response to an appreciation of the Swiss franc. Now, import prices, these are retail prices, of imported goods in Switzerland. So this is stuff that people can buy in the, in the supermarket, imported goods. They fell by about three, four percent on average. Um, so it's basically a three percent decline on average in the first year of import prices relative to domestic prices at the retail level. By the way, if you look at border prices, not at the retail level, but at the border of imported goods, um, they fell much more. And that's kind of something we documented in, in the other paper with with uh, our and, and with Rafael Auer and Saraline. Okay. So there was this big change in the relative price, but of course the biggest one was if you look at prices of goods that Swiss are buying in France, Germany, Austria, Italy. Uh, we have the data. I'm going I'm to tell you a bit in a, in a second. There, basically, like the prices in Euro didn't change much in Germany, so. The prices move. This is like identical goods uh, that, that they're buying um, in in Switzerland and in the in the in the in the in the, in the cross-border countries. They fell much more. Kind of. Let me tell you a bit about, more about this. So this is the price gap for the cross-border good purchased goods. So this is we look at identical items purchased both in Switzerland and abroad. You see that on average, prices in in the in 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 in, uh, in, in the European countries in the, in the border countries are cheaper. Everybody that goes to Switzerland knows that that Switzerland is very expensive. But they became so that's why Swiss, especially those close to the border, do a lot of shopping um, across the border. But the prices fell by a lot uh, after the, after this appreciation. Now what we're going to look at is what's what are the implications for quantities? So we're going to look at expenditures, prices times quantities. Okay. So 
for these two, given these two changes in rally prices, imports versus domestic and cross-border versus Swiss purchased goods. So the left panel shows the ratio, the, the ratio of imports relative to domestic expenditures. So imp relative to dom, okay? And this is for different horizons. So in the, in, uh, up to 12 months. So the green and the blue line is in, in the two years before, 13, 14. So the, the ra this ratio is about 36%, which it's an import share of 27% in, 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 in for the goods that we, we cover. So the import share is obviously much higher than the US because it's a small, it's a small open economy. Um, but what's, what's, more, what's interesting here is that there's, a, a, as, we, as we should expect, with an elasticity bigger than one, uh, when there's this appreciation, there's a, for every horizon, there's a jump in the share of imports to domestic. Um, and there's also an increase in the expenditure ratio of cross-border goods relative to domestic, domestic uh, purchase goods, imports and domestic. You can see that these, these ratios are much smaller. So of course, cross-border shopping on average is not so high. There's, it's going to be much higher close to the border. I'm going to show you. Ariel, can you explain what you mean by that horizon? I'm just kind of missing what you mean about the horizon in these different years for yeah, the different so colors. I was going to have a slide later, but let me tell you now, Sam. So it's like, if you plot the, 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 the share month by month, it's very volatile and there's a lot of seasonalities. So we, 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 the, to, the way to, to the, the way we did it instead is we look at like the first, oops, this is like two would be like aggregating imports in the first two months uh, of, the, of the year 2015, divided by the sum of domestic expenditures over these two, two months. Um, that's for 2015 and then it's the same horizon for the other two years. Okay, so you can see that uh, over time, the share goes up within the year. Again, this is partly because of seasonalities, but the comparison here is always like within, a, within an horizon, you wanna compare 13, 14 versus 15. And this is the last month, it is basically total 15 versus total 14 and total 13. These are cumulative. Cumulative, exactly. Yeah, that, that word is clear, yes, within the year. So this will be, we're going to do mostly, a, we're going to focus a lot on the annual horizon. So this is just a sum of the import share in the year. Okay. All right. So that's kind of the aggregate picture. But now we want to look at the, the, the heterogeneity uh, across space and across the population. Okay. And so we want to identify the heterogeneous effects of exchange rate shocks across agents arising from both initial exposure, okay, and uh, in particular initial exposure, some agents, some households import more than others, and how much uh, cross-border shopping they do. So, so the same shock will have different effects because different households um, import differently and uh, do more or less cross-border shopping. And also in terms of the elasticity, the responsiveness. So we're gonna look at how different are the elasticity of institution between imports and domestic and between uh, cross-border and, and domestically purchased goods. Associated to differences in income arising, for example, due to non homothetics the fact that um, we're gonna see how different are the elasticities by, by income, for example, and by distance to the border. So in particular, let me give you a preview. So you, using the, um, the scanner data that I'm gonna describe in a second for non-durable consumer goods. So let me tell you kind of what we find in terms of initial exposure. This is in 2014 before the shock. Okay. So of course, in terms of proximity to the border, we find that households that are closer to the border, they do more cross-border, uh, they have a higher cross-border expenditure share. But the import share doesn't really vary systematically with distance to the border. In terms of income, we find that for the categories that we find, there's really no significant difference across income groups. So the import share for the goods that we, we observe is 
not correlated with, with income in, in the in the in of, of, of the households. Okay, so the key the key the degree of heterogeneity in terms of exposure is distance to the border. So we're gonna have a price shock that is gonna have different implications according to how close you are to the border. In terms of the elasticities or the responses, we find that the elasticities do not vary much by proximity to the border, but the income, uh, the elasticity do vary systematically with income. In particular, we find that richer households, higher, higher income households, substitute less between imports and, and domestic. And substitute less, although depends on the horizon. It's, that's why I have a minus or a zero. It's not that robust to the horizon. Uh, but they also, for the, at least for the first few months, they substitute less uh, between cross-border and uh, domestic and import expenditures with higher income. All right, so that's kind of a lot of what I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you is I'm gonna document this. And then we're gonna basically focus on two implications of, the, of these facts. Um, one is to identify empirically how um, the, the, the response of retail employment, that is employment in the retail sector across regions in Switzerland, and kind of unexpectedly, we find that written employment falls in regions that are more exposed to CV shopping, because in those, those are the regions where um, CV is more, it's, 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 there's more cross-border shopping, so people can substitute, so, so the substitution towards buying in, in Germany became more important. And we see that in the retail study, employment statistics. And second, the second implication that we have so far in, the, in, the, in this work is to, to think about what these differential elasticities that we estimate um, between imports and domestic goods matter for welfare after, uh, uh, after um, changes in the price of imports. Okay, so either you can think of this as changes in trade costs or changes in, in uh, or, or uh, exchange rate induced change in input prices. So, so we're going to look at consumption prices only. We're not going to look at the income side um, of heterogeneity. We're going, to, we're going to find that in terms of income, uh, low-income households, given that low-income low, low households substitute more between imports and domestic goods, they're going to benefit more or they're going to lose less, depending on the, 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 the sign of the change we consider from large changes in relative prices, either due to exchange rate movements or trade cost changes. Of course, for small, for small changes in prices, these elasticities are, these are second order effects. Um, but for, for a 20% devaluation or, or, or sorry, for 20% change in prices or for changes in trade costs like the ones we, we consider when we do in, in trade papers, which are a lot going to Autarchy, we're gonna get big differences in welfare coming from these different elasticities. And of course, in terms of the distance to the border, uh, those that are near to the, that are, that are close to the border, they're gonna benefit more uh, from an exchange rate um, uh, appreciation or, 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 or suffer more when, when, when there's a lockdown to CB uh, shopping as it was this year, as I'm gonna show you. Um, when, when the Swiss, uh, when, when Switzerland crossed the borders to, um, okay, so, so, but, Sorry, but, let, me, let, me, yeah. let me just ask a question. So, uh, I, I would have thought that the welfare implications, of this would be tiny. I mean, you showed us that it was like one and a half percent of consumption expenditures was cross border. Um, I could yeah. see like distributional stuff would be big, but, um, just using some sort of elasticity would, if we shut it down completely, it's got to be not that big. Are, are you yeah. going to get a much bigger number than on, on aggregate, you're absolutely right. It's, it's small, but, yep. but there's some regions like Basel, which are very close to the border, they, they spend like 10% on CB. Um, so, so for a large change in prices, that's going to that's gonna be larger. Um, now, the one coming from income, they're even if the elasticities are very large, the differences are very large, for this to show up, then you need a large, a large price shock. And, and then can I ask you to like, um, it seems like you're, you're like focused a little bit narrowly on this. I mean, why not also think about vacations? Um, I, I have to think that like 
travel and hospitality are going to respond a lot to the exchange rate. Um, so is that, would that be something that would, could jack up the, the effects? Is that somehow included in what you're doing? Uh, not in our data, but I'm going to show, if I have time, I don't have enough time, I'm going to show you some credit card data that uh, other researchers in Switzerland are using to measure this cross border. And, and I think that includes like things like tourism and there the share of CB shopping uh, aggregate, it's about five or seven percent. So it's much bigger. Yeah. And probably that is because it includes, it includes that. Okay. So sorry for the squeeze slides, but how do we relate to the literature? So. Sorry, uh, I also have a related question. Um, yeah. So you've been focusing on the distance to the border, but I think what's across the border really matters. So um, don't you guys think like, you know, for some locations across the border will be just like, there's nothing there, but you know, for yeah. some of the Location yeah, that so across the border, there are a lot of options. So, yeah. how, can you, you know, maybe can yeah. control for so that? We're, we're gonna we're gonna measure distance, not in miles, not also because there's a lot of mountains. So, in terms of time to the closest store on the other side of the border, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna tell you that about that in a second. So, but that's gonna how, how we're gonna address how we're gonna deal with that. So, all right. So. Of course, there's a, there's a large literature in, in mostly in trade about the differential price effects across income groups of international shocks, and mostly coming from variation in import shares by income. And now, in this literature, typically, they do not observe trade shares by income group. So they have to fill the gaps in data by either using a structural model, uh, like, like um, Pablo Namit's paper, or basically using sectorial data, assuming common trade shares and elasticities within the sector, and then just looking at variation in exposure to sectors across income groups. Or there's this nice paper uh, coming in the, in the AR Insights um, that uh, basically used a SATO Varsho weights, which is basically implicitly assuming elasticities, estimating elasticity without assuming ruling out demand shocks, which we can allow in our estimation. Um, so we observe import shares and estimate import shares, import elasticity directly by income groups. Now the limitation of our analysis is that we have a, our data is on a small set of goods, supermarkets and drugstores. Now th there's also a literature uh, on trying to think of why a price sensitivity might vary for different income groups. Um, I mean, jo George, uh, work on this uh, um, for a while. So we're going to provide some uh, empirical estimates of why of, of, of differential import elasticities uh, by income group. Uh, now there's some work on expenditure switching and income effects. Um, we're going to focus on heterogeneous expenditure switching across income groups rather than expenditure switching real by aggregate income fluctuations, like in this paper by Bems and Di Giovanni. And then there, there is some work on cross-border shopping, mostly about looking at US, Canada, the border. And we're gonna have, I think, a better measure than a, in a lot of this literature because we are, we're gonna observe actual expenditures by household, whereas they use number of border crossings um, day by day. And we're gonna have a, a large exchange shop. So let me kind of, let me, let me get started. So um, with what we do. So, so the, the, the framework we're thinking is, 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 is the, 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 sim, the simplest one to think about this we think. And so this is, we're gonna think about a baseline, uh, a nested arbitrary uh, um, uh, aggregator, where basically this is for a household age. And they're gonna get, they're gonna consume other goods that we're not gonna observe in our data. And what we're going to observe in our data is going to be consumption of cross-border a cross-border aggregate and an aggregate of domestic and import goods purchased in Switzerland, where the sigma is the elasticity of division between cross-border and uh, domestic and imported goods. I'm going to tell you a bit about one micro foundation of this, and then within the domestic and imported aggregate. This is going to be another CS between imported goods and domestic goods. So produced abroad and purchased in Switzerland and produced in Switzerland and consumed in Switzerland. 
and these are different elasticities. And so a couple of things. So we're not gonna, we're planning on introducing non homothetices explicitly later. We haven't done that yet, but so we're gonna take like this utility function for each income group as, as given. And another thing to notice is that, okay, so the one micro foundation of this, for this aggregator, is that, let me, let me, let me click this one. So um, you can think that a household goes shopping at a fixed intervals and spends a fixed total amount of Swiss francs each, each trip. And every, 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 every interval, the, ho the household chooses where to shop locally or abroad, given price differentials. And there's some shock to that, so something that affects the, 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 how much the, cons the consumer values purchasing in Switzerland or, or abroad, which is, could be related to, to the time cost, uh, for example, of driving, crossing the border that day. And with the right distribution assumptions for Che, you can get exactly the, the, the CS aggregator where the, 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 the taste shifters, the news, relate to the ease of CD shopping and the elasticity sigma relates to the dispersion of, of these preference uh, shifters in, in, in this algorithm model. So that's how, you can, that's how you can think about this kind of reduced form uh, CS aggregator. Another thing to notice is that we don't have here product categories. Um, in the data, we will have product categories. We'll do a bit of that. And um, now, for, for cross-border shopping, we really, the data is very sparse to, 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 to do a lot of, to use a lot of the information of, of border categories. But for the imports and the versus domestic nest, uh, we can do something with, with the product categories. And what we, can, what we show is that basically the change in the import shares are mostly accounted for by the allocation of changes in the import share by, within product category. So we do a within between the composition of the change in the, in, the, in, the, in the import share across categories or within categories and over 80% of the, of the movement in the import share is coming from changes in, in beer from uh, Swiss beer to, to say to German beer. So that's why in the baseline we're gonna abstract from that, but we're gonna do a bit of, uh, uh, in our estimation, we're gonna, we're gonna allow for that. Ariel? Yes, Sorry. have you looked at durability? So I don't know what you mean by product categories, but like goods that you buy once, you know, a year or you know, a, a yeah, more durable but, good, you go yeah. across the border or most of our goods are non durable because these are things you buy in the supermarket. Um, so we don't have we, it, we it, so 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 you can a lot of like a lot of Swiss have like, like some friend in Germany and they send their Amazon packages there. So we so those are more for more like non durable for more durables, but we don't have that information because that may give you bigger effects too. And like, I don't know, there might be more substitution of you know cross border sure. if you just gotta go once or okay, that's true. So, um, All right. can, I, can I follow up real quickly on that? I mean, ultimately, these um, there's like a shopping time constraint someplace, and then there's like inventories. Uh, it's not clear that any of those kind of are gonna any of those kinds of models are gonna aggregate up nicely to. Um, kind of the CES framework that you have in mind. Yeah. Um, I, I think what you what you kind of did quickly was to sort of argue that it might, but um, it's not clear that it will. So. Yeah. No, I agree. And they're very special assumptions. Like you get this. Yep. We're gonna only use this in the end for our for one of our applications, which is for 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 for, for welfare. We're gonna use okay. the pricing. This is coming from here. For the empirical analysis, it's gonna be like more. Um, I'm gonna show you some facts, and you can. Rationalize those facts with your, with richer models as well. That would be. But will, will you have data on time use, for instance, or? Um, no. You, you have the number of shopping trips, or? Yes, we do. So I mean, there's some cost to that that'll show up someplace. Yeah. You do yeah, welfare. We the number of shopping trips, but yeah, that that's true. Okay. Um, there's that data. Okay. So that so what for 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 our purposes what what data do we need? We want to have household income and size again. I'm, I'm going to show you some results by size too. We need household level panel data 
on expenditures by product and by country of purchase, that is purchasing in Switzerland or, or, or abroad. We, we, we want to have product country of purchase specific panel on prices. And for products purchased in Switzerland, we need to know if the good is imported or, 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 or produced uh, in Switzerland. So to get, so we get a lot of this information in this uh, AC Nielsen data set. So it's a, it's a home scan data and covering um, about 3,000 households over this time period. So households are going to be binned into by, in, in seven income groups and uh, into seven size uh, groups from one to nine. And they're going to, the households in, in, in this data uh, record purchases in supermarkets and drugstores. So again, this is basically covering things like food, beverages, personal and household items. So an observation is going to be a, a transaction is going to be the household ID, the barcode of the digital good, the quantity, so the Google Strike expenditures, the price, the date of purchase, and the name of the retailer. And there's a code whether the purchase occurred in Switzerland or abroad. In order to, to get the, the country of production, whether the good is imported or not, we're going to use this um, web page called the codecheck.info. Uh, which gives uh, the country of production for, for, for a subset of goods. So the, the barcode is not that precise, at least for Switzerland, to, 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 to know whether good is important or not. So, so, so using this, we cover about 72% of expenditures of goods that are purchased kind of continuously uh, around three, month, three years around the, 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 the shock. And again, the, the import share is about 27% for, for, for the goods we consider. If you look at total consumption expenditures in Switzerland, about 20, the share of, of, of imports is about 27%. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip this. Also, so there's only a small share of transactions abroad. So if you look at cross border, so let me show you that. So this is the fraction of households that do any CV shopping, again, over different horizons. So this is in one year, only about 25% of our 3,000 households purchase anything abroad. And then the, the fraction of, of transactions uh, purchased abroad is about 2%, and it just go up. But again, as I'm gonna show you, there's a lot of variation in space. I'm gonna show you that in a second. So given that, that, we only, that we only have such a small share of transactions abroad, we're gonna make some more restrictive assumptions on CV shopping. We're not gonna be able, for example, to, 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 to use the product category information. In terms of the income and the size that is gonna play, again, it's one of the degrees of heterogeneity we look at. So we have seven um, income groups going from 20,000 from, from 20, uh, francs annual to 180. Okay. And this is kind of representative of the, of the income distribution in Switzerland, either using wages or, 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 or annual income, disposable income. Okay. So we're going to be, but there's very few in this high, in this high, high income category. Okay. And, uh, and if you look at how good is this measure of income, does it relate to expenditures? So, okay, yeah, so if you look at, these seven bins, and you look at the expenditure in our data for those bins, they line up pretty well. So it turns out in our data, the higher income households do spend more uh, in a given year. Okay. And one more thing about, about, about uh, income. So the literature has done a lot of work looking at the share of consumption in goods versus services, for example. By income, so there's 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 a um, there's a bunch of papers like uh, Javier Cravino and Andrei Levchenko. They look at the impact of devaluations on on prices by by income, and they look at the fact that higher income groups spend, tend to spend more uh, on 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 services. 
And that's true also in our data. I mean, not, not in our data, this is using the official Swiss data. You can see that the share of expenditures in goods is decreasing in income. And also the, 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 the share of spending in the goods that we cover in our data is about 20%. And it, it is slightly declining in, in income. So we're going to cover this part of the of expenditures. Okay. So again, the literature has mostly focused on this, on the fact that services versus goods shares varies by, by, by income. In Switzerland, that is also true. But we're going to look at within goods, what's the variation in, 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 in inputs. All right. So what I'm going to do next, so I'm going to first document the initial exposure. I'm going to show you that CV shares are higher closer to the border, um, whereas import shares uh, and do not, are, are not systematically different according to the distance to the border. And uh, import shares do not vary uh, systematically with income, nor CV shares. Then I'm going to show you um, the responsiveness to this shock. I'm going to show you, as I told you before, that import shares will rise by more, by less, for high income households. Then we're going to, I'm going to tell you how we estimate these elasticities by income. And then I'm going to talk about these two applications, the retail local employment effects and the heterogeneous welfare integration. OK, so first initial exposure. So this is first import shares relative to domestic expenditures by household on income, size, and driving time um, to the border. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to tell you how we measure this in a second, um, as I was telling uh, Daniel. So we can see that basically import shares do not vary much by, by income. They do not vary much by, by, by driving time to the border. And they're slightly um, uh, lower for, for, for bigger households. Okay. Um, so we're going to have that in our, in, our, in, our, in our quantitative application, but we're not going to focus too much on this. OK. So now, in terms of, in terms of exposure to, to CB cross-border versus domestic purchases, so this is basically um, a map of Switzerland. And uh, this is basically the CB share um, by, 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 by region, by two digit codes. Okay. The darker colors are more um, are, are higher shares. Okay. I'm going to show you the levels in the next slide. And this is the, the, our measure of distance to the border. Okay. And, um, and uh, I, as I was saying before, we're going to measure the, the, it's going to be the, ta the driving time to the closest uh, supermarket on the other side of the border. Okay. Notice that all these regions here, they're close to the border, but you need to drive a lot to get to a supermarket in, in, in Italy or France. So that's why they have a high a driving time, even though they're close to the border. And you can see from here that, of course, there's more, the CV share is higher for regions closer to the border. And here's kind of uh, some levels. So this is like in the two zip codes uh, against the driving time. And you can see that some shares are, are up to like 10 or a bit less than 10%. And in the year after, the 2015, they go up to close to 15%. So there was a big increase. But on average, in George, these are small. Yeah, like 1.5%. Now, you can do this at the, at, the, at the household level. The same regression that I did before, but for CV share against income and size. And again, the only one that comes significant is, is driving time. Households that live closer to the border, they, they, they do more CV share. Um, OK. So, so now let me tell you about um, the heterogeneous responsiveness, the elasticities. Okay. So, uh, so first, let, let me, I'm going to focus, I'm going to first uh, show you the response of imports versus domestic produce goods. So no CV share here. Just uh, goods purchased in Switzerland, imports versus domestic. So this is like the simplest figure you can look at. So think of, you take all the house codes and you group them into those in the bottom three income groups, below 60,000 francs. 
and those top four groups with income above 60K. And you can just look at the change in the import share uh, relative to domestic expenditures, 15 versus 14. That's a red line. The, diff, the, the, high in, the, the low income minus the high income. So this is- Ariel, sorry yes. to interrupt it. It seems like kind of uh, a little bit like Rock's point, Rock Armitage's point. Um, could you get data on the closest store within Switzerland? Because maybe it should kind of be the differential between going across border or going to the store in Switzerland. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's, um, I think we, we looked at the center of the two zip code. We only, we only had, we didn't know the location within the two zip code. Um, I, I forget how, how it was computed, like within the two zip code. Uh, what, what if they're using, I think, I think that we're using a store in the two zip code, but I'm not sure. I should check that. I think, Sarah, you're not here, right? If you are, you can. <laughs> uh, okay. But, but that's a good question. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, so you, what you can see here is that, okay, and so this is 15, 14. Again, it's a different diff. It's the change in the import share for, for low income minus high income by horizon again. So this is like a, 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 after 12 months. And this is the same, but between 14 and 13 before the shelf. And you can see that before, not, the, the change in the import share is not very different for the two income groups, but in, in, in the year after the appreciation, import shares go up by much more for low, um, for low income groups and for high income groups. And then again, like quantify this in terms of elasticities, but these are gonna imply pretty big differences in, in, in elasticities. So this is like the, the raw data. Let me, let me do this now at the, at the household level. So, so we're gonna run this regression first at the household level. So it's the, again, the change in, in, the, in the expenditures on imports versus domestic. Again, with a horizon by horizon, month by month, on, on, on income of the household, size of the households and distance. You know, we're gonna look at a balanced panel of, 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 of households. And yeah, and then I explain a lot of this already. And we're gonna try different weights, different clusters. Yeah, so, 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 so let me show you what it gets. So first, distance, this is the coefficient on distance. As I mentioned before, distance doesn't really matter. So if the, the, the change in import share by distance is insignificant. It's basically close to zero. So no effect of distance on changes in import shares. Um, no effect on, if you, if you look at size, does, doesn't, doesn't vary much. So the, 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 these are estimates of, of row T. So no effect of household size and changes in import shares. Now, if you look at it, um, income, this is beta for different time horizons. This is 14, 15. And we see that the, the the increase in the import share is smaller for, as you increase uh, for, for households with higher income. Okay. So, so higher, uh, higher income households experience a, a rare decline in import shares between 14 and 15. Okay. And if you include distance or not, the estimates don't change much, not surprisingly. And now, in terms of pre trends, so, so if you do this for 14 versus 13, Okay. Um, so you can see that there's no evidence of a continuation of pre-existing trends because the betas are exactly the, the, the other sign and not significant towards once you have enough months. Okay. And in fact, so it, if this is not a pre-trend, if anything, it's like reversion, but, but this, this reversion disappears if you aggregate um, by income and size, Okay, then, then the, the 14, 13 changes become significant, but the 15, 14 still become, are still significant. And, um, and when we look at within product groups, so when we estimate this within product groups, again, 14, 13 is insignificant and 15, 14 is significant. So these are all sort of us to including income per capita rather than income, not controlling for size, weighting, this, 
within product groups. This is so this works within product groups. So here it is. So this is only looking at the import share difference changes within a product group. We have like about 80 product groups, things like beer, wine, cheese. This is within cheese, substitution between Swiss cheese and French cheese, for example. So this 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 holds, and again, 1413 is not significant. And using inter, inca per capita is, is also lost. So that's kind of the first fact that there's the, that responsiveness really varies, uh, but with, with income imports versus domestic. Now, when we do the same for for CV, Ariel, can, can, can I follow up on that? Yeah, yeah fine. I mean, it seems like there's a parallel within countries in that like poor people are much more price sensitive in their shopping trips. Um, so, you know, people will travel much further to save a buck if you're poor versus rich. Uh, is there any way of kind of comparing the results within countries versus this cross country to see if there's something really different about crossing the border? So you mean like in response to a shock, there's evidence that the response- Just, just that we, we know the prices are cheaper at Walmart than at the corner grocery store. Rich people won't drive to Walmart where poor people will. Um, so there always are, you know, poor people are much more price sensitive with their shopping trips in general. Right, right. So, so I guess, so our findings are consistent with that, except that we're yeah. identifying that with a shock, right? Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering if this is a stronger effect or, or a weaker effect. That's kind of, it would be interesting to sort of put it in, in the parallel. Sure. Um, yeah. So you, you have to uh, refer me to some of those, those references. Okay. Yeah. Now, now we, of course, we can do this for CV, CV response, the cross-border response. Okay, so we do exactly the same specification at the household level. And the change in the expenditure on CV versus, versus, um, versus domestic uh, uh, purchase. Um, and when we do that, again, the distance doesn't matter. So the how close you are to the border doesn't affect the elasticity of, of, of CV uh, shopping um, to the, the, the change in the CV. Sh sorry, the, how this how far you're from the border doesn't affect the, the change in the CV share. In terms of income, uh, we do see that we get the same pattern that um, lower income group, higher income groups increase CV shares by less, especially in the first in the first nine months. So that's consistent. With the with the fact on imports and with the, with with the fact you were you were the, the the within country fact that you, that George was mentioning. Now the reason that that we're not like so we're not pushing this too much is that if you look at fourteen thirteen, um, the difference is only significant in the first three months. So the difference by income in how much CV shares go up only uh, can be only observed in the first three months. After the first three months, the response is, is insignificant related to income. Okay. So, um, yeah, so, so and, and these negative results are robust to, 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 to all the things that are listed here. So, um, okay, so now, so now kind of the step three is to uh, use this reduce from facts to estimate uh, heterogeneous elasticities across income groups. And then we're going to use those elasticities for some very simple back of the envelope and welfare implications. So, okay, so now we're going to consider like the, this is using the, the CS formulation that I wrote before. So we're going to have this um, um, implication from the model, basically the, the change in the import versus domestic expenditures for a given households as a function of prices. And here we allow for demand shocks for import versus domestic by household. So we're going to first assume that prices are, are, are common across households. Then we're going we're gonna to allow for, we're going to construct group specific prices, but the, 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 the results are going to be not very different, although less tightly estimated. Okay. And we're going to parameterize these elasticities as being basically depending on linearly or, or log linearly on, on, on income. I mean, depending on the log of income and the log size uh, linearly. Okay. So in the end, so we're going to replace that here. 
And we're going to be interested in these coefficients beta and gamma. Okay. So, uh, so what are the assumptions that we need to, to estimate this, this, how the elasticities vary by income and by size? So the, so the, the, assumption, the key assumption is that these demand shifters for imports versus domestic, okay? The deviation from, from the average is uh, uncorrelated with, with income and, and, and size. So maybe everybody likes to buy more imported goods in this period, but the difference from the average cannot be correlated with, 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 with the income before, before the shock. Okay. So that's kind of, that's the assumption for, for, for our, that we're gonna use in our estimation. And so yeah, so that, that's kind of, that's why we work here. Now, why don't we identify this, our, I mean, this eta here. So this is like, remember what this eta is? It's, it's a, this constant here. To identify that, you need to basically assume that there's no demand shocks at all, that those are zero. So we're not gonna push that too much. We're gonna, what we're interested in is more like how the, the elasticities vary with income. So we're interested in these betas. So we're gonna construct prices um, using the data that we have. We cannot take into account product entry and exit because the data is just too, it's too sparse. Um, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to skip all these details because I, I have less than 10 minutes. Um, so let me just show you the, 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 so given the prices that we construct, so these are the elasticities that come out. So this is, these are estimates of, of beta n. Again, for different horizons. In the first two months, basically, the, 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 we, we got a huge positive numbers on negative, so we cannot tightly estimate that. But you can see for, 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 for horizons over three months, these, these betas, positive betas, are pretty uh, tightly estimated, uh, or at least they're, they're, they're far from zero, I would say. How do we interpret them? So consider the beta of 2.66 here, a 12 month horizon. So this is like taking the full year. Uh, consider two income groups, one with less than 20,000 francs income and the other one, and, and one with 130K, 135,000 uh, annual income. So these are like almost the two extremes income groups. Then our estimates imply that the import elasticity is a five, basically, it's five higher for the lower income household group. So this is a pretty large difference. We were surprised by this. Um, how can they be so large? Yet we don't see in the le in levels, we don't see differences in, in, in import shares across income. Well, it turns out that even with, with these large differences, if you feed in like small price shocks into our model, the, we wouldn't, you wouldn't see them in levels either. So that's, the model is consistent with that. And of course, this elasticity might be smaller over longer horizons. And, and of course, in, in practice, in the data, there's all kind of demand shocks. So that could also like wash out the, the impact of, of income. So again, we do a lot of robustness in this estimation, and we always get like very high um, um, income effects on, on, on elasticities, and even within product groups. And using a, a household specific prices. But I'm, I'm not gonna show you that given, given lack of time. All right, so this is a summary kind of what I told you in the introduction. Um, so there's the only, in levels, in terms of exposure, the only thing that comes significant is distance to the border on CV expenditure. And in terms of heterogeneity elasticities, the only one that comes significant is income, especially for, for the response of imports, not, not so much for CV, although it's there, but only for the first three months. All right, so now that the two, the two applications, the first one um, is- pure... Ariel, yes, on that I... last, I wonder if you could justify the results kind of based on what George was saying, because doing the cross border is kind of a big fixed cost maybe, and so you kind of go and buy some durable right away or stuff that's gonna last. It could be like soap or something, and then, that, that all that effect is right away, and then you've already done that, so you don't keep doing it. But whereas if it's just shifting to buying imported stuff, there's no real, you just go to the same store and 
maybe the store owner has done the same thing and just replaced sure. domestic with imported. And so there's no reason for a time profile of it. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, maybe a fixed cost could explain the dynamics. Yes. And um, of course, the, 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 there was some dynamics in the exchange rate as well. The appreciation was smaller after first after the first three months. So the, the benefit, the, the, that gap in prices was not declined over time. So that could be partly that. But yeah, the fixed cost suggestion, that, that's, that's a good way to, that's, to, to interpret this. Okay, so now kind of, so the two applications, one is purely empirical. It's just like, we would, we, 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 do we see that retail employment fell in regions close to the border compared to regions far away from the border in 1514? So we have employment data by four digits. So we, we, we did this distance to the border or time drive to the border, the closest store by four digits. And we're gonna run a regression like the em employment um, on distance, stacking all years and including convenience on, uh, sorry, zip code fixed effects. And we also control for income in the, in the, in the, in the, in the zip code. And here's like a scatter plot, a bin scatter plot, this is the first two years. I'm gonna show you then also the first year, this is annual data. So this is the, the change in, in retail employment by four zip code on the distance to the, to, 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 to the border to see shopping. And we see that employment in retail falls by more in, in, in regions that are closer to the border, which is consistent with this idea that that's where these are the regions that are more exposed to these shocks through CV shopping. If you do this for non-retail, you get, if anything, you get the opposite, the opposite, uh, the, op the, op the opposite effect. So this is something that affected retail. So this is for one year. This is like over time. So now, now I'm showing you the, the, the estimates of beta. And this is the blue line is, is retail. The red line is non-retail. And you can see that even in the first year, I mean, again, the, the, the markets, the labor markets are not so flexible in Switzerland. So it could take a time for this retail sector to, 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 to change the, the size. But it, you can see that there was, in, in the previous two years, there was no trend. But after, after the shock, um, we see a, a big increase in, 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 in retail employment in sectors that are, in, in regions that are far away from the border compared to regions that are close to the border. Whereas for non-retail, it, it's, it's not very large and it's almost insignificant. Okay, uh, and the last, the last thing is uh, how do these, um, what do these uh, estimated elasticities imply for welfare differentials across income groups to, uh, to a price shock, either trade costs or exchange shocks. So um, we're gonna, so we're gonna fo focus on, on goods in our data because we don't have the data for, for goods that are not in our data. Um, for, for, for CV, we're gonna impose the same elasticity across households, which is true for 12 months. There's no difference in elasticity by income at the 12 month horizon. And we're gonna calibrate these parameters, ADA, this, the, the constant in the elasticity formula to match the overall change in the, in the, in the import share after this shock. And we're gonna assume that within uh, income groups and within zip code, all, that, all these sh demand shifters are common. And of course, we're gonna abstract from heterogeneous income change, which we know is an important part of the differential welfare effects of trade cost changes or, or, or devaluations. Okay, so let me skip this. So these are the, the elasticities as a function of income. We have seven points here and household side. So again, like if you take, the, if you compute the aggregate, the implied aggregate elasticity is three. So if you, took, if you take the aggregate change in import shares relative to the change in prices, the implied elasticity that you get is three. So there's a lot of substitution in our data after this shock. This is the aggregate one. Now, across bins, either income and size, there's a lot of, there's a big, there's big differences. So, and I mean, the, the extreme for, for low income, it's about five units higher than for, for the high income. This is what I was telling you before. 
Okay, so, so now let's feed in changes in prices. And let me just report like the change in the price for different income bins. So this is first feeding the, 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 the Swiss price changes, like 3% declining import prices and 10% declining CV prices, like we saw in 15 in Switzerland. And this is the change in the price by household income. The first obvious thing is that, and I'm really comparing, say, Basel, or the or, or, or regions close to the border where the CV share is about 10%, to a region like Zurich where there's, in our data, a very small CV share. So that's gonna be the red versus blue. So of course, the, um, um, there's gonna be a, a households close to the border, those that are spending CV share are gonna benefit by a lot, about 1% compared to, to, the, to the households that don't do CV share. Now, you can see here, of course, for small price changes, the, the elasticities don't matter because this is a, this is a, these are second order terms. So, so um, for small price shocks, in the, the, the household income, the welfare change by household in income doesn't matter much. Now, now let's consider a, a larger change in the, and now I'm gonna start considering a kind of increases in prices. Think of it as devaluations or increases in, in, in import trade costs. Okay. So this is a 20% increase in, in, in import prices compared to three. So now you can see that, that, that it matters, and in particular, uh, um, lower income households uh, lose less, the, the price goes up by less because they can substitute more. And the difference is about 1% now. How big is 1%? Well, let's consider the standard exercise in the literature, which is comparing households with high versus low income sh import shares. So 27 versus 32% in import shares. Okay, and in the data that I showed you, I, I, we saw that, so for example, poor households spend more on goods, so they have a, they have a, a, a higher import share. Okay. So to give you a sense, so going from 27% import share to 32% import share, that is increasing the import share by 5%, it changes welfare by almost as much as going from the low income to the high income group due to these differences in elasticities. So that's the, the sense of magnitudes of how this matters for 20% price change. Now, of course, if you consider bigger price changes, again, this is always relative to the lowest income bin, the difference becomes, this is like the highest income group price change divided by the lowest income group price change. For small, in, for small shocks, it doesn't matter, but for, for large shocks, 50%, it's gonna matter a lot. And, and, and it just stops. So, so this is like, now if you go to other key in trade, which is like the, the standard trade counterfactual we consider, now this it matters a lot. You go, the, the welfare loss from going to, to other key is 50% versus 5% for the prices. And finally, the, the, for, for, if you go to other key in CV, which is not a totally counterfactual, in fact, Switzerland closed the borders for, for, for three months uh, ending in June. And, uh, and in fact, we can see that the CV expenditures went to close to zero. There's data on that. And then we can see that, of course, the, 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 the households that are close to the border, that, that, that do a lot of, of CV shopping, the, the price goes up by a lot compared to, 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 to the low uh, uh, CV share in households. So let me, let, me, let, me, let me conclude with this slide. So we basically looked at the unequal effects of internationally induced price changes. And we look at two sources of variation. One is spatial variation due to cross-border shopping. This margin is mostly missing the literature. It's important for Switzerland, but also likely to be important for, for small countries and for countries that with, a, with, a, with a lot of population across the border, as soon as the border is open. And we looked at variation by household income. And again, this is at the heart of the, a large international literature, non homotheticities And we find large variations in price sensitivities, and which are hard to estimate given other available data sets. And we, we, we looked at the implications for local retail employment and for welfare. And basically the bottom line is that the poor benefit more 
or suffer less from large price changes if they're more price sensitive. And those that live closer to the border benefit more from foreign price reductions. And I'll stop my presentation here. Okay, great. So let's just open up the floor. Questions, comments, go ahead and unmute um, and have at it. Can I speak? Um, it seems that you're using this homothetic CES structure. And I wonder if a lot of the facts could be explained more parsimoniously if you just introduced a decision on the part of the household to how often to go cross-border shopping. Because then once you cross the border, you can buy, you, you've incurred the fixed cost. And then there might be a lot of goods that you'll buy across the border. Maybe they're not cheaper than they were in Switzerland, but some are, but you've now faced this fixed cost. So you might shift a lot of spending across yeah. the border, um, even though some of the prices hadn't changed relatively. And you could also get the income effects there. Presumably higher income households face a larger cost of, of taking a trip across the border. I think yeah. that I think Ben Faber and co-authors have a paper of Walmart in Mexico that kind of looks at shopping in different locations using a kind of price index for a store. And that might I could see that as being an approach here, a, a CB price index versus a Swiss price index. And you're making a decision about going CB based on the whole price index, not just relative prices of individual goods. Yeah, you know, yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's a good suggestion. So, of course, there's one micro foundation that gives us exactly this, but it's not the most interesting one because basically, I mean, the, the one that gives you literally this is that you just go, like period by period, you get a shock and then, and there's no fixed cost. And, and with the right assumptions, we get exactly CS, but then there's no normal authenticities, et cetera. So, I agree that with fixed costs or you could get something more interesting, and as 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 a, as George and Sam were pointing out, this could also explain why the biggest differential effects of CB are in the first three months. So that's something where clearly we can go, uh, we can we can we can extend and make the model much richer. Uh, and, and and also one of the things we want to do is to put in explicitly non-homotheticities for the import versus domestic. Um, elasticity and and Ben has another paper, the 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 one um, the poly where they actually they they put in nanomaterials similar to to uh, Grossman, Feynman, Hellman, where there's an outside good and that affects the elasticities. And when they estimate the elasticity, they also get that higher income groups have lower elasticity. So though that they're not import versus domestic, they're just like elasticity substitution across goods. And the differences are not so big, um, so that's something we wanted to 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 to, to take it more seriously in the model. Yeah, that's where we're going. Could also have a question related to your um, difference between high versus low income population and their varying elasticity over over time. That that you uh, estimated. I, I was thinking also related to what George was asking before, how much does that relate to, seems like you know the interpretation of that demand system is more or less like a summary, kind of a reduced, reduced form interpretation of that, but how much that reflects also the fact that the low high income face different choice set, uh, which is often a decision that made by the retailers rather than the consumer themselves. Um, over time, and uh, and the, what's got reflected here, of obviously, will, will be in their expenditure share, but it, it might not be a decision that actually made by themselves, but but rather just the uh, rather just the retailers. So, the uh, related uh, kind of uh, suggestions that it seems like the Nielsen data usually have retail scan, as well as the customer scan. So I don't know whether you guys have comparable retail scan data coming from Switzerland too, which possibly could. Uh, shall I on these uh, on these uh, facts? Yeah, no, th thanks. That's, that's that's a great comment. So you know, so we don't have the full scanner data. I think it costs a lot of francs, so it's it's very expensive. And um, but uh, 
It's, so it's easier to buy in Argentina, but not in Switzerland. <laughs> that's, a of working, that's an advantage of working with Argentina, not with Switzerland. But um, so there's basically two big retailers. In, in There's two supermarket chains that do like almost all the, the, the retailer, the retail in, in Switzerland, Coop and Migros. So, um, so we think that like this, by income, these, these households are buying mostly in the same, in the same supermarkets. And, 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 and prices do not vary much over space. So these are like very, there's a lot of uniform pricing within this retail, retail chain. So I don't, and, and, and our results, these, these differences also hold if we look at within, within product categories. So uh, it's not about composition of, of expenditures over different product categories, like cheese versus beer, and the substitution could be different there. This all holds within. Um, so I don't think it's too much about um, the fact that they are exposed to different goods. But we don't have the full universe, universal data, but that would be great. Yeah, I, I just just follow up very quickly. I, I do see this is very convincing without that you have it hold mostly in the within the product group. What I have on mind is like different as you know, the standard scan data have like these SKUs, right? You have like premium cheese versus regular ones and then you know the possibly but uh, but anyway, even just from the retailer, even from the customer side, possibly you guys can already do some check, but you know, um mm -hmm. having the retail scan will be even better, obviously. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, sure. go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, hi, this is Omar Boston Fad. Um, I was wondering, looking at your graphs on the aggregate shares and on slide seven, uh, I was wondering if, uh, in light of the heterogeneity, specifically heterogeneity, you you found you can tell us sort of about the composition of uh, what groups are driving uh, the the aggregate response. Uh, the biggest one, obviously, is in the in the bottom three income groups. So, if you look at only like the top income groups, um, the, the the it's much smaller the response. So, yeah. So this aggregate increase in the import share is mostly coming from from the low from the from the guys that 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 that, that are more sensitive. The, the, um, okay. So it's yeah. like basically only them. That that's what drives that what dri that's what drives all the aggregate response we typically see. Yeah, I mean we could show this one only for the two groups. We show only the difference. Um, I think that if you only include the top three, probably won't see yeah, a big a big increase. But that's a good. Uh, we should show that. That's a good suggestion. Thanks. And again, then this this is like even when you do the elasticity that takes into account that potentially different households pay different prices, there's still like a, it's not like, the, it's not that prices only fell for the goods purchased by the low income groups. When you construct the, the group specific prices, and uh, this, this still, this still holds. The LFCs are, are, are different. So, um, so Ariel, I, I have like an inventory model in my head as I'm thinking about these shoppers. Um, of course. And in fact, I have like this economic order quantity model in my head, which basically tells me like, you know, how often people are going to shop and how much they're going to buy. Um, and it's going to depend upon the fixed costs, the holding costs, um, and some measure of their income. Um, and it seems like you can use like, if you have data on shopping, shopping trips, time between shopping trips to sort of back out exactly like how fixed costs, holding costs um, are going to vary with income. Um, Moreover, um, you know, when you're thinking about like estimating like high frequency changes, um, those models also tell you like kind of the way you're going to respond to shocks depends upon how much stuff you have in inventory already. And so to the extent that you're seeing these guys going shopping, if I went shopping just before the exchange rate depreciated, I'm not going to take another shop uh, appreciated. Um, I'm not going to take another shopping trip right away. And so if you bring in that extra information, you're going to have a much better way of identifying some, you might have a better way of identifying the short run effects. As you do these accumulating effects, you're kind of, you're kind of going to the basic EOQ model where you're kind of averaging out over the year. But for the short run effects, if you control for like how much they have in stock, which is like their last shopping trip, you can kind of maybe get some better identification. Uh, so yeah, kind of two points there. Yeah, no, no that's great. Um, 
So this is like the fraction of households by horizon cumulative. So let's look at the yep. first two months. You can see that it doesn't go up by much. So at least in our data, there's not so there's like 300 of them or 350 that do any CV shopping. Um, so I think that a lot of it is coming from the fact that um, I guess on over long horizons it goes up by more, but it's it's a lot of it is coming from the from the intensive margin. That um, but but we haven't looked at trips um, because we could measure like how many times they're buying in different dates. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's something we, we, we could do more. On. I mean, that identifies the fixed cost for all these all these different guys, and then the size of the order. Um, right. You know, I mean, it's it's very simple to sort of write the formula down and back it into like, using the trips and the size of the orders to back into like the, the fixed cost and the holding costs. Um, right. So. Of course, these these goods are mostly non-durables, although they 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 could they they could still be stored in the freezer. And, yeah, I mean, so you could look at the heterogeneity between milk and other goods if you wanted to as well. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. there's just, there's a lot of richness in the data um, if you kind of apply that model to it. Um, so. Yeah. No, that's that's that's. I mean, that, I had to mention. A good suggestion in terms of pushing more the structural side of the CB part of the paper. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Ariel. Yeah. yeah, sorry. So I don't know how you do the for the retail employment uh, results. I don't know if you have a sense of how much you know. There's like local demand shocks or local demand changes, and maybe bigger declines in you know aggregate consumption closer to the border. I'm thinking like maybe these guys also have like their financial assets or their income in euros or. And they're more likely to hold, I don't know, savings in euros versus francs if you're really close to the border. So maybe that also depresses demand. And so I don't know if there's a way to control for that or if you have a sense can, of. We can control for income and the results don't change much. That's before or that's? That's income. Um, I think we do b both before and, uh, and after. I mean, at the aggregate level, this shock didn't have a huge impact on the Swiss economy. Like the GDP growth rate maybe fell by 1% compared to the previous two years in 15 versus 13, 14. Um, yeah. So. But I'm thinking maybe, you know, in some areas it declined, you know, or it increased more or, or less than in others. I mean, what I think is interesting is that this differential effect on distance happens in the right in the kind of in the reasonable direction only for retail if you look at yeah. the retail it goes yeah. it's much flatter and it's actually it was happening before regions close to the border in non-retail like manufacturing and they were they were going faster so and that that is i mean and there were some articles in the newspaper like the retailers were complaining that everyone yeah. was crossing the border to shop in in I germany see. The, okay. in, in those couple of months after that. So this is something, it's just like quantifying that. And so we, we, we found it pretty striking, especially because these adjustment costs for, for employment in Switzerland are pretty high, so, but, but, but it does show up, especially right. after two years. Actually, for all, I, I, I think I, I, I agree that distance uh, makes a lot of sense here, but I'm just a bit surprised at the magnitude of the decline. You know, the reason is because I think you have retailers, you know, based on what you describe and the, at the pass through, you know, the retailers also raise their markups. And then, and also I see the domestic uh, retail expenditure still pretty much dominate the, the kind of cross border kind of volume, right, in some sense. So, you know, I, I, I think there's some offsetting force here. So I'm never surprised that why it gets so negative. Uh, in, when the graph you were showing actually almost for, I don't, yeah, it's just, just a little bit hard to interpret the, 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 the kind this of, yeah, this part, the kind, the kind of profitability, why, why, why uh, uh, you know, because the retail employment is a reflection of the retailer's profitability has been going down, I guess, the total profit has been going down. So, so can you do a rough calibration, for instance, you know, maybe, 
it'd be useful to kind of get a get a sense of you know given the composition of expenditure of consumer not changing dramatically and uh, and it does this kind of this type of this magnitude of the economic improvement actually make quantitative sense or not I guess. yeah so what that's one of the things we could do which is to write a model of employment as well and take the magnitudes from the yeah so we haven't done that yet, but that's kind of one of the uh, one of the things I wanted to get from this presentation is exactly what 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 are the most interesting directions that we think that we think we can we can pursue. I mean, in terms of markups, there's really like we looked at price variation by geography, and again, this is like these two large retailers, but I guess this is for supermarkets. There's very little variation. So I don't know how much. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not. That's what I'm products. saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm not looking for across distance variation. I'm just surprised at the level. You know, I, I think the yeah, I totally agree with the market shouldn't vary. You know, across yeah, uh, you know, the distance to the border. It, it could part of the answer to Daniel's question be that um, they just kind of shrunk, and so they're they're still profitable, but they just kind of shrank had shorter hours or something like that and so so that all the margin for decline was in terms of employment they still have to rent the same space but yeah we can do it in terms of we have the data on like the time equivalent by I mean, the including the margin and the number of employees i forget which one is larger but both both give this um yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, I, I was surprised that I, I wasn't expecting that it was going to show up so starkly in the employment data. Although, again, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that that was, that that margin was relevant. There was like newspaper articles at the time of retailers complaining about this. So, so Ariel, isn't this with Campbell, Lapham Fine, and the US Canadian border? Basically, that, you know, yes. these yeah. locations, yeah. right? Um, respond uh, it seems like what you're doing is also related to uh just cross-state shopping in the united states right like um like when i was in philadelphia everyone went to new jersey to buy alcohol um, so people are always doing this tax state arbitrage for excise taxes so is there is there anything like i guess uh again i'll ask it you know i sort of asked it before like are, are the effects bigger with this one because it's or smaller because it's viewed as maybe like a temporary thing like an exchange rate thing or versus tax changes are bigger. It might be nice to kind of relate yeah, those findings. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you for the, for the references. Okay. Uh, what, yeah, so, so, so Beverly Lapham and Campbell have this paper looking at stores in counties close to the US-Canada border, and they find exactly that. I mean, their, me their measure of cross-border is like people that cross the border back and forth in the yeah. same day. Um, and, 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 it's, and it's consistent with that. Uh, one of the... One of the things that we're looking into now is we have prices in uh, in the in the neighboring countries and prices paid by locals, Germans in the in the same towns and in, or Austrians in Austria, etc. And we can now compare the, the the prices that Swiss paid when they went to Germany versus the prices that Germans paid in the same location, and we find that Swiss paid uh, higher prices, we cannot control by the same retailer. Of but course, yeah. That would be kind of, and the uh, and the gap goes up after the in 2015. So that could be consistent with like the type of models that you write, yeah. like search models, and and the Swiss go there and they don't know exactly where where to buy, um, where to buy goods cheaper, and they end up being kind of screwed when they when they buy these goods. There could be some Swiss in the listen to this and maybe you have some personal experience to share. I don't know. This is just what the data shows. So that's kind of one suggestion to, to think of a search framework like that. And, and that model, we know that gives you the number of business, right? That, yeah. that hiring people uh, search less. So they're, they're less sensitive and, and, they're, and they pay higher price. All right. Uh, any other any other questions? We can leave the we can leave the uh, chat open, or we can leave the line open. But I think we'll call it the end of the official uh, 
uh, the official seminar, we can stop the recording. So now we can say stuff about everybody who's not here. <laughs>